Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation, Supporting Faculty Beyond Course Design Online Teaching Principles. Today we have two chat options, one on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar below the video for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. If you're asking a question to the speakers, please use a question mark at the beginning of the question, as this makes it easier for us to scroll through and identify those questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for the session, Stacy Powers, and we'll get started. Thanks, Lindsay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today. My name is Stacy Powers. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Cengage's Institutional Group. Our team works with leaders at over 200 institutions across the country to provide affordable access to digital learning at scale through our Cengage Unlimited subscription for institutions. Today, I'm very happy to moderate this panel of leaders from Oregon State University eCampus. These administrators found their faculty in need of professional development for online course design and facilitation. This session outlines the principles of their research-based program, which promotes quality online teaching and learning. Oregon State's online teaching principles are available under a Creative Commons license and may be leveraged to train instructors in designing and facilitating fully online or blended courses. We'll be weaving in audience participation opportunities throughout the session, so get ready. And I, But first, I would like to introduce our speakers, um, Catherine McElvage, who is the Assistant Director of Course Development and Training, and Shannon Riggs, who is the Executive Director. So I'll turn it over to the two of you to introduce yourselves and get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Shannon Riggs, and I serve as the Executive Director of Academic Programs and Learning Innovation for Oregon State eCampus. Oregon State eCampus is a large online education provider with over 85 degrees and programs, serving more than 26,000 students per year. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Katherine McAlvich. I am an Assistant Director of Course Development and Training at Oregon State eCampus and faculty in the OSU Graduate School. We're very excited to introduce you to our research-based online teaching principles during this presentation. And we'll also be highlighting how and why these principles might be a useful framework to consider adopting or adapting for your own institution. Thanks, Catherine. Let's begin with a poll. Do you have, um, and we're, we're gonna use poll everywhere. Hopefully you're familiar with that. There are a few different ways to participate. Um, do you have standards, principles, or are some other shared vocabulary for articulating what good online teaching looks like at your institution? Give everyone a chance to respond. Great. And Catherine, can you tell me if you're seeing the responses on screen? Yep. Great. Thank you. Good. Good. I think we've got a good mix of responses here. Some are using a set of external standards and principles. Some are using internal, and some are not yet using using some. So hopefully, we'll um, be able to to provide you something that you might find useful for today. All right. I'm going to go ahead and lock that, and then let's move on. So um, we'd like to start with our origin story, story, why we created the online teaching principles. Uh, well, it started when we were receiving requests from academic program leadership for help with criteria for online teaching evaluations and promotion packages. Sometimes supervisors were in the position of evaluating online teaching, but they didn't necessarily have online teaching experience themselves. We also had invested heavily in course design support and training. We had used full service instructional design, multimedia development services, faculty training that's required. Um, but the support kind of dropped off once the course started being taught. 
instructional designers were available for help, but there wasn't anything as formal as our development process. And finally, because we've been offering online programs since 2002, we had faculty of all experience levels, you know, ranging from super experienced all the way to brand new GTAs and instructors without much or even any teaching experience. New instructional faculty needed a tool to, that, that could paint a picture of what good online teaching looks like. And our more experienced faculty needed a tool that they could use to help guide reflection on their own teaching practice as they, as they were striving to, to improve and grow. We wanted our principles to be really strongly rooted in best practices while also reflecting the demographics and needs of our online student population, which at eCampus tends to be non-traditional adult students who are working, raising and taking care of families, and looking to be really highly engaged in their course content. So the idea was to have a resource that speaks entirely to the actual facilitation of the course so that it's also a helpful tool for faculty who teach courses that they didn't design and who may or may not be able to make substantive changes to that course content. So to develop the principles, we triangulated important themes between four different sources. First, the research. So we looked specifically at contemporary studies and literature that focus on teaching practices, pedagogy, and student success in fully online asynchronous courses, as well as hybrids, which I'll say a little bit more about later. Secondly, we looked at our annual student surveys of OSU eCampus students, which surface both effective and ineffective online teaching practices. We wanted to help capture and encourage the effective practices and ensure that our online teaching principles would help provide evidence to counter those ineffective practices that we hear about sometimes. It's important to us to bring in the student voice too, and so we can truly say that our students' feedback has helped to shape our principles. Third, we review nominations for our annual online teaching awards. These nominations come directly from eCampus students and highlight again those exemplary teaching practices that enhance the online learning experience and that we want to help disseminate and promote among all of our faculty. And fourth, we looked at themes that my faculty support and training team encounters when we help respond to student concerns about online courses, again to help shape our online teaching principles with an eye toward student success. So our goal was to make these principles really concise and easy to digest. We aimed for no more than 10 and landed on 10 related to online teaching and one additional principle specific to hybrid teaching. It was critical for us that these principles be evidence-based and that we'd be able to point faculty to a few key resources for further reading and exploration, which you'll see in the bibliography that, that accompanies the principles. And we'll share these principles with you in just a moment. Finally, and very importantly, these principles needed to be road tested by some of our own faculty to help promote buy-in. Before we publicly released them this past January, we partnered with faculty in our School of Psychological Sciences, and they were great. They helped provide feedback on the principles themselves and how we could clarify the wording of them, as well as how they could be used to plan for online teaching and actually make revision to teaching practices. Faculty on our online education committee at OSU also provided comments that we used in final revisions. Of course, what we've released so far is just version one. We anticipate that we'll make revisions as we receive additional faculty feedback and as online education research produces new insights into the online course facilitation practices that have a measurably positive impact on student success. Great, you can find the principles um, at the, this link here. Um, and I think Catherine is going to pop that in the, in the chat for you. Yeah, Got it? In Zoom and in feed loop, yeah, if you wanna go take a look. Okay. And we'd like to just dive in and, and really cover, cover each of the principle, principles briefly. Okay. So as you're perusing them, we're gonna just start at the top. 
Um, as I mentioned before, one of our goals was to make them really concise, but part of the reason why we wanted to spend a little bit of time unpacking each of them is to just give you all a better sense of what we're hoping to communicate to our faculty and see if these are things that are important at your institutions as well. So at the very top of the teaching principles list is stay current, but it's important to note that we didn't list the principles in what we considered to be order of importance. Um, rather, in some of these first few principles, you'll see that we're prompting instructors to think in chronological order about preparing a course for publication before it's actually released to students. This first principle is a call to ensure that course content is up to date, it's functional, it's published on time, because we know that online students will immediately encounter barriers and get frustrated if things like internal and external links are out of date, or if the course is not published on time, for example. The second principle, encourage equity, is a reminder of the students we are serving, who, as I mentioned before, are largely non-traditional adult students with diverse work and life experiences and equally diverse needs. Again, this is a principle to be considered before the term starts, which is why it makes it sort of to the top of the list, but it also is an important reflection point for faculty as the course gets underway. We're really encouraging faculty here to clearly state and use policies that will support our students. In the structure of the principles, you'll see kind of the title, the principle itself, and then an annotation. And in those annotations, you'll see a number of possible examples that would fulfill each principle. In this particular one, perhaps the most critical piece is allowing late work, even if it's just for partial credit. So I'll give you an example. We've heard of two issues in courses that we wanna help instructors avoid by using these principles. First, some of our faculty don't always allow late work and our students really count on the ability to turn in work late for a little bit of a deduction as they make really hard choices about how to manage their complex responsibilities. The second issue that we're trying to kind of help circumvent here is that some instructors do allow late work, but they don't say that they do, which doesn't really help students. So this is really about equity and transparency and keeping those needs of non-traditional students in mind. Thanks, Catherine. Um, you know, the next one is to communicate clearly and quickly. Um, and, and this one is all about, you know, when we're online, we kind of expect things to be instantaneous. You click a button and you get the result. And online students may have some similar expectations, not exactly, but, but similar expectations for quick responses from instructors. Also, students on campus in, in traditional courses know that they'll be able to catch the instructor just before or after class or in their office. Um, online with no synchronous meetings, it's difficult to know for a student when you can reach your instructor. Students can post a question and then they sometimes will keep checking back to see if it's been answered yet. Um, and that can get frustrating, especially if um, you aren't sure how long an instructor is going to take to get back to you, or if you're waiting for an answer that you need in order to complete an assignment. So one of our principles is to, is to communicate clearly and quickly. Our policy at Oregon State eCampus is for instructors to respond to email or questions within 24 hours on business days. We also encourage faculty to post communication plans in their syllabi to let students know the best ways to contact them and how long to expect to wait for a response. It's also important to keep in mind the pace and structure of the course. There are times when faculty will need to be more available, such as when there are like high stakes, high stakes assignments that are due. Um, and there are times when it's okay to be a little bit quieter as, as the instructor. And because online courses are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including weekends, faculty should be clear about their weekend availability and, and align their deadlines with that availability. So we always recommend that faculty don't make assignments due on Sunday night if they know that they're going to be offline on the weekends. Um, it, instead, if you know, make that due date on Monday evening so that you can be available to answer some last minute questions uh, from, from your students. Along the same lines, one of our principles is about providing notice to students when something changes or something unexpected comes up, and it will. Um, the last couple of years has shown us anything. It's shown us that unexpected things will, will happen. 
So if you have a storm or a fire or even just a simple illness comes up that requires a change in your course schedule or your timeline for responding to students, just let students know as soon as possible. We've talked a bit already about timeliness um, and providing grades in a timely manner. It, it is important, especially if your feedback is going to impact the students' next steps or their progress in the course or the next steps on, on the assignment. But what's just as important as timeliness, though, is, is uh, providing meaningful feedback. You know, feedback needs to be substantive and helpful. Saying good job or just simply giving a grade isn't really helpful for students. Um, at Oregon State eCanvas, our student success team um, does an annual student survey. And one of the things that we've learned from that survey is that our students rate the interaction with faculty as the most important thing affecting their satisfaction with the class and their learning. And this is year in and year out. That is the number one, um, the number one thing that's important to students is that interaction with the faculty member. Also interesting, we asked in the same student survey, um, asked our students how they define student success. And their number one definition was mastering course content. So they really want to know that they're getting it and your meaningful feedback um, that is timely really helps them to know whether they're, they're hitting that mark or not. Great. And in addition to what Shannon just mentioned about how highly our students rate the value of interaction with their instructor, that aligns nicely with quite a large body of research now showing that instructor presence is really key to both online student success and satisfaction. So that's not just our eCampus student population, that's across online students nationally. So in this principle of be present, we're calling out that there's a few key methods that faculty are usually going to use to demonstrate, demonstrate presence, namely by making good use of the tools in the LMS, by encouraging active learning, communicating effectively and consistently, and by motivating students to be participants in their own learning. One of the other things we hear from our eCampus students, and this is fairly specific to the way the courses can be taught, is how important and effective use of something like an announcements tool can be. So for one thing, we know our students are really savvy. They notice when faculty post canned announcements and they may perceive them as being canned either because the content is really generic or we've had students say we notice that our faculty post that announcement at the exact same time every week, like 8 a.m. on Monday. So that makes me know it's automated and that maybe my instructor isn't really there. So conversely, when faculty personalize announcements to what is going on with that particular group of students and use this tool maybe as a way to give broad feedback to the class, help students make connections between modules or weeks, or otherwise demonstrate that they're engaged and paying close attention to what is going on in this particular online classroom space, our students tell us how much they appreciate seeing that evidence the instructor is present and working right alongside of them. Presence is also really important for us because, again, it's something that's within the control of each instructor. So as I've mentioned before, sometimes we'll have faculty take over or teach courses that they didn't design, and maybe their department encourages them to not make changes for curricular or accreditation reasons. But presence is a place where each faculty can really bring kind of their own style and unique take on this to the table. And it's really meaningful for our students. This next principle of fostering community is closely intertwined with be present, um, especially for this particular principle. We have in mind both faculty who designed their courses and those that didn't teach or didn't design them again, rather. Both types of faculty, so regardless of who designed the course, faculty that are teaching need to be active participants in the course and help make that sense of uh, community among learners really meaningful. Um, because that's what makes them visible, right? But it's also what helps to make that community really rich and not have it just be kind of one-to-one -one interactions with students. One aspect of course facilitation that we're trying to emphasize heavily here is participation in online discussion forums. So this is where that community piece really comes in. In years past, some of our faculty have perceived that discussion space to be a student-only kind of space where students need to talk to each other. 
but we know that discussions are much more engaging and productive for students when faculty weigh in and when they actually play kind of facilitator roles. Um, so they might help kind of keep discussion going, they might ask students additional follow-up questions, or ideally kind of connect this group of learners together by comparing and contrasting or um, bringing in one student's response to respond to another student of, oh, did you see what student A posted earlier? That relates directly to what we're talking about here. So this is really all about promotion to help engage engagement with peers be really meaningful in the course. Yes, supporting students is another of our online teaching principles. And, and what we mean here is communicating in a supportive manner. Just like with speech and writing, your tone of voice really matters. Um, at Oregon State, our, our online learners tend to be working adults who stopped out of college at one point and who are now back to complete their degrees. These students may have had negative feedback in, in the past, may have some um, success challenges, um, academic struggles, or they simply may just feel like they've been out of school for a long time and they're worried that they won't be able to keep up. Being supportive and helping students adopt a growth mindset is really important for these students in particular. You know, helping them identify their strengths as well as where they need to improve can really help sense a, a, create a, a sense of belonging. Another of our principles is to reach out and refer. You know, just as you might note who is attending an on-campus class, keep an eye on your learning management system in your online class to see if there are students who are not participating, who are not logging in, or may have missed an early assignment or a deadline. Warmly reach out and, and being inviting. Let students know that it's not too late to catch up and, and try to make a connection with them. And then when you, when you are able to connect with them, if you find out that they need some extra help beyond your class, know which resources are available and refer students as, as needed. Tutoring, success coaching to help with time management, mental health resources, financial aid, hardship grants, human services resource centers, um, all of this will vary based on your institution and the resources that are available. But the idea is to know as an instructor which resources are available for your students so that you can help connect your students to the resources that they need. We're almost to the end. This is the last principle of the group specific to online teaching, cultivate inclusion. So we know that our eCampus students are in some ways more diverse than our on-campus student population at Oregon State. And so this principle helps to highlight the need for faculty to implement evidence-based principles for inclusion in the online learning environment, which has been a special research focus for eCampus staff and faculty. What we don't mean here, that it's easy to kind of interpret this way, is we don't mean diversifying the curriculum. And we don't really mean universal design for learning either. We're less focused on the design aspects of inclusion. While those are important, those are covered well in other resources. For example, there are many things related to inclusion in the Quality Matters rubric, since we're a Quality Matters institution. Um, but really what we're trying to emphasize here is, again, the facilitation aspects. So we want this principle to help faculty focus on things like how they get to know students, how they build relationships with them, and how they support them um, with equity in mind along each student's learning journey. So one really important strategy that's called out in that annotation is encouraging students who may feel like they don't belong in the higher education community, whether that's because they have one or more marginalized identities that they don't see represented in higher ed. As Shannon said, maybe someone has told them along the way that they didn't have what it takes to make it in college, or because they have other kind of persistent self-doubts about their academic abilities. So we're encouraging faculty to make use of that time during the term to really interact with students, get to know them, help them in ways that employ high impact practices in inclusion specific to online courses. And last but not least, 
Our 11th principle, this is for hybrid or blended courses only. Um, eCampus offers select programs in a, what we call hybrid modality. And we wanted to be sure to represent, even if it's just at a high level, a key component of effective blended learning and teaching, which is to explicitly and intentionally draw connections between in-class or synchronous and online or asynchronous learning activities. So for those in the audience today that work in the blended learning space, you know, this principle isn't as easy as it looks, right? This is actually a really challenging thing to do in terms of making clear to students how the different pieces of the course work together and how the hybrid modality changes how students should prepare for and think about each component. So much of that work can be planned before the term, but is actually an active part of facilitating the class during the term and helping students to make those connections between out of class and in class learning. And it's going to require slightly different work with each group of students too. So it felt like this was a nice fit for our teaching principles. Thanks. All right, let's go on with our next poll. Um, so which online teaching principle stands out to you as being most important, either for your own course or helping faculty at your institution think about their teaching? Go ahead and type your answer into the Poll Everywhere poll and it will generate a word cloud. They're still rolling in. <laughs> I have to say, though, I'm not surprised that present and presence is figuring in so importantly in this word cloud, because I think for many of us that work on online education, and especially those that support faculty or help with professional development, this is a toughie, right? Because it's a very broad category of strategies and faculty need to know not just why to do it, what's the actual impact on student success, but how to do it. And how to do it can depend on the course and the particular style of the faculty. So this is a, this is a big one, definitely one that we emphasize. Yeah, and one that has to be really maintained throughout the teaching of the course. You know, so much emphasis goes into design of an online course and there's just so much effort involved there that um, you know, once the course goes live, really the, that being present is the, that's really the main work of the, the faculty member. Alrighty, let's, let's move on. It's going to let me. <laughs> there we go. Now we'd like to tell you a little bit how we are using online teaching principles, uh, uh, you know, now that we've established them, at least the first iteration, and we'd like to invite you all to use them too. We've made this tool openly available with a Creative Commons license to help make it easy for other institutions to adopt them. So I can share, um, we're using this tool with faculty who are doing some peer reviews of teaching. Our online psychology program has adopted them as part of their peer review process. And these are just some concrete things to look for in online teaching, aside from those course design elements. We also reference online teaching principles in our check-ins with academic program leads to help ensure that administrators and instructional faculty have a common language and a shared vocabulary um, and a, just a common understanding of what good online teaching looks like. And then if we look at that group of 
kind of four toward the bottom, these are really all about faculty development. So I'll speak a little bit to those. So in working with faculty, even in the, you know, 10, 11, going on 11 months that we've been actually using these after we published them in January, we've already seen these principles make a difference, especially when it comes to preparing new faculty to be effective online instructors and helping continuing faculty um, to improve their practices through a refresh training that we offer quarterly. One of the ways we've already seen some improvements is we needed a concrete standard around response time. We had the policy about a 24-hour response time that Shannon mentioned, but it was more persuasive to have it be a principle and to have research stand behind it that showed why it's so important for student success. So that was really helping us to make a difference and getting more faculty to buy in and actually go with that policy in their syllabus and in their course. Um, additionally, our principles are not intended to be a one-time checklist. We see them as a framework for thinking about and continually refining online teaching approaches and choices, which is why we've also mapped all of our other faculty trainings and professional development offerings back to the principles. So let's say an instructor comes to me and says, I'm really interested in learning more about this cultivate inclusion principle. That one seems a bit dense and challenging, which is exactly what it is, right? There's so much going on um, and so many possibilities there. We could refer that person to the foundational training that we have on this topic, as well as rotating special topics offerings, because we know that this is an emphasis faculty are interested in. And finally, I wanted to just comment on how important it has been for, to, for us to help faculty connect teaching and course design choices as part of using this tool. So I'm going to tell you a quick story, um, a really recent and encouraging one, and it came again from this pilot that we've been doing with our School of Psychological Sciences. So the instructor, or the instructional designer rather, working with a psychology professor came to me and shared that this um, professor was really engaged in thinking about how the assessments in her online course should be different now that she was thinking about the actual teaching of the course, right? So it was no longer a question just about course design. It was about, hmm, this is, I have a fairly large online class. How am I best going to be able to actually interact with students, give feedback in a timely way, make sure I can give meaningful feedback on this particular assessment before students move on to the next one that's related. So it was really great to see. Because so often as we're working with faculty, they treat course design choices totally separately from online teaching choices. Sometimes they don't think about the actual facilitation and teaching of a course until they're ready to launch that site in the LMS and start working with those students, right? So now we're able to have a resource that pairs really nicely with the Quality Matters course design rubric to encourage faculty to think about these decisions as entirely interrelated. So going back to the psychology professor, right, by focusing on the principles while she was still in the course design phase, she could really rightly think about the real workload involved in teaching that course and how she was going to best use her time and energy to support students and motivate them. And then she made the final course design choice about how she wanted to create that particular assessment. It was really exciting to see. All right, um, our last poll, how could the use of online teaching principles have a positive impact at your institution? Give us a second to respond. Retention. Student satisfaction. Providing structure and consistency across programs, definitely one of our goals. Persistence for students. Absolutely. Good responses. Definitely. Yeah, thanks. 
whoever contributed the quality piece. We, we think this is really important for us to help our programs, especially the courses and programs that are already online to take it to that next step and make sure that the teaching part has been covered well. Because again, we've done a lot with the Quality Matters rubric. We do a lot of training around course design. This was kind of the next piece for us in that puzzle of how do we help you know, improve the quality continually in our online courses. Great. I like the consistency piece too, because that is hard. You know, this is another place where, you know, faculty have to be convinced sometimes, and I'm sure many of you have encountered this, that there are principles that resonate across disciplines, right? When it comes to teaching in a particular modality, but this can be kind of that common core or that place of reference for consistency sake that is, you know, a little bit separate from disciplinary specific teaching strategies, but really is something all online instructors can use. Great, well, thank you for those great responses. Now I'd love to turn turn over. I've seen some great questions popping up in the chat. Um, Stacy, I don't know if you pulled any out that you think we, we should answer first. I did. So some, you've got some great feedback in there too. Um, and I wanna make sure we get a couple of these questions answered. So there's two or three that are along the same lines that are, um, you know, these are great principles and they like how you've tied them to OSU guidelines. How do you or how do you evaluate it? So do you look at the courses that faculty have taught? And then, you know, along the same lines, do you know, how do you know the principles are working or effective? Great, I think there's a variety of ways um, that, that we're approaching evaluation. And, and as Catherine shared earlier, you know, these are still fairly new at our institution. And so we're really just beginning to roll them out. So this is something that I think will evolve over time. Um, but one of the ways uh, evaluation is happening is peer-to-peer -peer in, our, in our psychology program who first piloted these, uh, the online teaching principles. They're using um, the online teaching principles and observing each other's online teaching um, and, and using the principles as part of their peer review process. Great. And then it's also, you know, so how do you know the principles are working? So are you getting some feedback from those peer to peer? And then how do they show up in annual performance evaluations? Great question. Catherine, do you want to address that? Sure. Yeah. I think one of our goals in making the principles and the resource the way it is, is to give departments some flexibility to in how these could be used in peer review or other types of annual teaching performance evaluations, whatever they call them. Because we're such a big institution, our colleges handle those processes a little bit differently in each case. There's some consistency, but there's a little bit of variation there too. So we wanted this to be a resource that could be really widely used across different faculty groups. As part of this pilot with the psychology faculty, we are getting some feedback from them, um, both um, pre-course design, post-course design, and then after they do the peer review process to see how these are working and to get a little bit more insight into if there's particular areas where faculty might need a little bit of extra professional development, for example. So that's one piece that we're hoping will come out of this as other units, other departments ideally pick these up and incorporate them into their current processes or use them to supplement their current processes is that we'll get some information back from those units about, is, is there a particular area here that's a struggle? I've, I've already heard, and I'll just give you this example because it's separate from evaluations. Um, we have a lot of faculty interested in DEI practices at Oregon State, and there, we have so many ways. We're very lucky as an institution to have a lot of resources that are being put toward those efforts and how it works in sort of the workplace and how it works in student success, how it works in classroom teaching. And the piece that was kind of missing for us until we created this resource and some training around it is, but what does it look like online? So we've even had departments already express interest and say, hey, great, you know, this is a great list of principles. We already know faculty are interested in this one. 
around creating equitable environments and also cultivating inclusion. Can we work on this? So it's also that common vocabulary that Shannon mentioned earlier when we did the first poll of just knowing what the needs are and how we can support them. And I think we'll learn quite a bit about how they're working actually in courses, in teaching, and in evaluation through all of these conversations and collaborations. You know, a lot of it is about you know, building up that shared vocabulary. So while Catherine is, is, um, spends a lot of her time with, in faculty development and training and, and introducing new faculty and experienced faculty to, to these principles, I'm often meeting with uh, our college administrators and associate deans um, out in our, the 11 colleges that, you know, that are part of Oregon State University. And I'm sharing the online teaching principles to make sure that those, um, you know, that our, the, the leadership from our academic colleges are familiar with what, with what good online teaching looks like and what their faculty are being, how their faculty are being trained. You know, and, and I always, um, you know, point out that most of us who are, um, you know, working in online education today did not kind of grow up in an online education environment. And so it's not, we don't have a lot of necessarily firsthand experience as students in, in online teaching and learning. And so we need a resource and a, and a tool that can help us um, really paint that clear picture of what does good online teaching actually look like? What are, what are the hallmarks of it? Great. So we had another question, but I have one that I will kind of layer on top of that one. Okay. So you've designed an additional layer of your program for those teaching in a blended environment. Um, we had somebody ask if you've seen an adoption of this in face-to-face -face teaching, because it seems very applicable. Can you please share, you know, how you've added these principles and what other administrators need to think about when training their faculty for more than one modality? That's a great question. And we, we actually started developing these principles and shaping the pilot pre-COVID. So we didn't know at the time that they could be more widely applicable. And it turns out they can be, right? Especially as faculty, even teaching, you know, mostly synchronous courses, but they're maybe doing some asynchronous pieces. As they move more and more of that interaction into the online environment, these are things that could be used as tools, resources, points of evaluation, et cetera, right? We haven't seen this adopted face-to-face -face because OSU already had a really rigorous process for um, assessing and evaluating classroom teaching that covered most of these components and in kind of a holistic way. But um, to the point about our psychology pilot, I think one thing that's interesting is that those faculty very often do teach across modalities. At a minimum, they're teaching face-to-face -face and fully online. And so one kind of interesting piece of weaving this in now is that they could demonstrate how they're doing this in multiple modalities, right? And that could become fairly easily, and I suspect it will be, part of their evaluation, because it's not just about doing this in fully online courses. Students expect to hear from their, you know, face-to-face -face course faculty a little bit in between class meetings. That's instructor presence in the LMS, right? So definitely seeing some of these formerly very clear boundaries between modalities gray out, and these could be used for other modalities as well to support them. And I really expect that to continue to grow because uh, I know we certainly saw that as we rolled out um, and, and made faculty more aware of course design standards through the Quality Matters Higher Education rubric. Um, so many times we kind of help faculty work to apply that rubric in their course design and they get to teaching and they come back and say, you know, I know this is meant for online courses, but this is really helping me think about, you know, alignment of learning outcomes and the assessments in my face-to-face -face teaching. And we've seen that for years. And so I fully expect that um, we'll, faculty will, will, you know, not silo these uh, teaching principles only for a specific modality, but we'll see that they certainly have applications. And I think the, across modalities, but I think the, the trick is knowing how to manifest them in the online setting. And I think that's really where we try to focus. I will keep asking some questions if, uh, if others have them. Please, please post them in the chat. Or Lindsay, I don't know if I'm missing another spot that I'm supposed to be looking at that I should be called out to. But you know, you talk, um, you've talked a little bit about DEI, and I noticed in the polls that you're doing equity and 
and content and quality always came up. And these are topics that we're very dedicated to at Cengage. Can you share how these principles support students of all backgrounds to foster success? Yeah, that's a great question. And that it really gets at a lot of the training that we have to have to support these, right? So like I said earlier, this isn't an easy checkbox that we want faculty to use of, oh, I, I maybe have a strategy or two for that. We're learning so much more um, through research that other institutions are doing, through research that we're doing about how to support online learners in all of their diversity, because online students do bring a lot of different characteristics and experiences to the table. Um, so this is a perfect example of where the annotation is short, right? It gives a few examples. Those are not going to be the least bit clear to faculty of how to actually implement them in their online course. We need to provide training that backs these things up. So we see these principles very much as a framework. Faculty can say, oh, I'm interested in that, or maybe I feel like that's one of my areas of weakness in my online teaching. I'd love to learn more, and they can come to us. We have a four-week workshop, for example. It's called Inclusive Teaching Online that we've uh, worked on for almost two years now um, to really give faculty some concrete, practical, evidence-based strategies for doing these kinds of things in their online courses. Um, they definitely, those practices that we promote definitely overlap with other things around presence, around communication, why timely responses, for example, help us to lower anxiety in our online students. That's one thing we hear a lot and that research is really starting to show is how much more anxiety our online students can feel when they don't get a response, when they're truly held up on a question that they have they can't proceed. And given the type of student we see online, that might be the only time they had set aside that week to really dig into that particular activity, right? So these are all the kinds of strategies we need to orient faculty to and connect them to how they support the specific kinds of online learners that we see at OSU. I have one more question if I don't see another one in there. So I've gone backwards and how I, some of my questions that I had for you, but I know you were inspired by some of the well-established guides that were already available. Can you share what those were and how you use them as a launch pad um, for your unique principles? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a great place and thank you for the reminder, Stacey, because I said this early on, but if we had people joining late, one of the things that you'll see below each annotation, and if you scroll to the bottom of the web page, we have a full bibliography. So we're trying to draw really broadly from existing resources and put something together that had a bit of a value add in terms of we couldn't find actually a resource that did what we needed it to do. Otherwise, we would have been happy to adopt it. Um, but we needed to pull in lots of little kind of strategic threads to make this new resource and this new tool to share with our faculty. Um, but you'll see hints of all kinds of different research. You'll see hints of the QM rubric. Michelle Pekansky Brock's work on humanizing online education has been really important. The Peralta equity rubric has been really important, right? But again, not one of these things sort of stood alone as comprehensive enough for us to share with our faculty and to use as the basis for you know, describing this as what good online teaching looks like, generally speaking. And so we pulled in a lot of those different things, but that you'll see in the bibliography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having a research foundation is really important for us as an, um, an R1 institution. That's the really the language that our faculty speak, so we need to be um, speaking that same language with them. And really, the, for the reasons that Catherine just expressed, this is why we created them um, and made them available with our Creative Commons license so that others could could adopt them. And um, one of the things I really appreciate appreciate about the design of, of, the, of the principles is that, and I think someone commented on this in the chat earlier, is that they, um, they provide some structure, but it's not, um, it's not cookie cutter. There are many ways to meet each of the each of the principles and make them come to life and that's really important in an institution like ours where we have everything from you know the 100 and 200 level introductory courses all the way up through graduate education and all different kinds of disciplines so um, when you have a set of teaching principles they really need to be flexible enough to work in all of those um, in all of those different settings 
Yeah, I'll just add one more thing, which is one place that we thought we could really help faculty with this particular tool is by doing the synthesis work of the research that exists, right? Our faculty are super knowledgeable in their own subject areas, and they may be knowledgeable about discipline-specific teaching practices that they can and should be using in their courses, right? But what's kind of missing, and then this is where we come in and where we can be really strong collaborators as eCampus staff, is to help, you know, do the research. We're up on that, right? We can pull that together in a way that's really concise and makes sense to faculty. And if they want to dig in through something like the bibliography and click the links to learn more, or maybe they say, oh gosh, that's that doesn't hold true to my experience. I want to see what the research actually says, right? Go for it. We've tried to put all of this out and be really transparent about where these ideas come from. I didn't wake up in the middle of the night one night and make a list. <laughs> that I definitely woke up in the middle of the night and took notes when I when things would come to mind, right? Because that's how my brain works. But this really is an evidence-based kind of tool. So it's been really kind of, again, that value add for faculty. If we can help them along with their practices, especially those who are continuing on by sharing this out with them in a really kind of digestible way. And there's lots of different entry points, whether it be for brand new instructors all the way to, I've been doing this for 20 years. I was one of the pioneers at my institution to put a course online. Lindsay, are you seeing any questions that I missed? No, I'm not seeing anything that's come in recently, no. Okay. Well, I, I saw some good, some positive feedback in there, which I was thinking too, which is that um, they really liked how your OTPs are presented on the site. It's simple and easy to understand. Um, I think this is a really, you know, it, it's an exciting program um, and a resource to promote um, impactful online and and blended learning, and it sounds like even some face-to-face, -face, if you apply some of the principles, would make sense. Um, so I'm excited and hope that others will go out and look at this and really spend some time digging into it um, to see all of the great work that you guys have done. If there aren't any questions, I will, I will leave it to the two of you if you have any final thoughts or words um, for the group. But um, from Cengage, I just wanted to say thank you. This has been this has been great and helpful. I was taking lots of notes, so my head was down. That's what I was doing because um, I'm a note taker. But um, I just wanted to say thank you, and it was, it was fun being part of this group. Thanks, Stacey. We would uh, we would really love to hear from folks um, if you're implementing the the principles either in whole or in part, or or you know um, if you have feedback for us about how you know something you think we've missed or something that you think could make these stronger. We are very open to, to receiving that feedback. So please do reach out to, to myself or Catherine and let us know what you think. We, we would love to hear from you. And I'll just add kind of as a wrap up that I hope this gave you some insight into how a resource like this could be used, whether or not you have one, just in the kind of multitude of ways we talked about that we're using them. It seems like this is such a great time to be, you know, kind of reorienting faculty to what student needs are as we hopefully move into a post-COVID era, right? This has been, there's been so much focus and a really needed, renewed focus on student success and what the needs of our online learners are. And this can be one tool to help faculty, you know, make some different choices or tweak some existing choices that they're making to try to improve the online learning experience and make sure that it is really meaningful, really positive, really effective, right, equitable. All of these pieces are important and it's a lot for faculty to juggle. But going back to, you know, a list that can just help you reorient to what should I work on this time? Maybe when I teach this course for the 50th time, what's the new tweak I can make to try to make things better? We hope it's a useful guide in that way. And like Shannon said, we'd love to hear more if you end up using it or doing something similar. Let's keep this conversation going. Excellent. Thank you everyone for attending this session and a huge thank you to our presenters and moderator. A session feedback survey should be popping up. We really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out today as our speakers do enjoy receiving your feedback. We did record this session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us for one of our five sessions coming up next. Thank you all.